Rob Floyd has been named Bartender of the Year. His latest partnership with Cardi B launched Whip Shots and Alcoholic Whip Cream. He has been on Bar Rescue for the past eight years and is regularly featured on the Today Show, Access Hollywood, Fox and Friends. He's designed cocktails for the Oscars, Emmys, Grammys, the Super Bowl, and is a contributor to the Wall Street Journal, Times of London, CBS, and Fox. He has been called a godfather of modern mixology. Rob, thanks for being on the podcast. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I, I think I just it. pour heavy. Everybody likes that. So. Uh, that's probably what it is. <laughs> that's huh? probably what it is. So first off, tell us where we're at. Um, we are at um, my place, Sip Boldly, which is on 5th and Broadway in downtown Nashville. It's such a cool building. It's the oldest building in um, Nashville. And it's inside this amazing place called Teddy's. So the downstairs is this fun honky tonk. Middle floor is the speakeasy. And then we have a rooftop. But it's small. It's intimate. It's a really fun place. I remember when I first met you, you were telling me about this idea that you had for opening this spot when you were at a performance or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were like, man, it would be really nice to go to a spot that's a little more laid back. So I wanted uh, to have a different experience here. Um, and I got it from when my wife and I would come downtown is a lot of it was um, not value driven and not experience driven. So it was very fun. Oh, gosh, it's great, you know, when you're coming in to, to go to one of the places and to drink and to hear a lot of cover music. But I wanted something authentic and uh, something that really makes it an experience for the person that's that's there. Uh, so really hooking up with the, the Teddy's group here was a fantastic opportunity. And then being able to curate a small space, but a space that you get out of the madness of downtown mm -hmm. and be able to overlook it all and then be able to jump back into it whenever you wanted. So uh, when this opportunity came up, I was really lucky and blessed to be able to hear. Yeah, yeah. And you've been, you know, such a, a key component to mixology in the entire world and have impacted so many people uh, with your creativity in art, really, mm -hmm. which I don't think people necessarily associate cocktails all the time with art. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So let's back up. How did you get into this in the first place? I got into this in the first place because diapers don't pay for themselves. So somebody didn't show up for a shift and I lied my ass off, come and said, who can bartend? And I'm like, oh, I can. I had no idea what I was doing. But uh, by the end of the night, I was hooked. I loved it. And I loved it not necessarily because of the drinks, but because of the way I made people feel. I could remember their names, their cocktails, what they were having. And so for me, it, that moment, it became a study in reaction and a study in experience. Then I was really lucky and blessed to work with some of the greatest chefs of our time, from Jose Andres to uh, um, Gordon Ramsay to uh, Muhammad Islam, these guys that were just amazing and so giving, so giving. They just mm. wanted to teach. If you were there and you were a vessel, they would they would give you everything, the keys to the kingdom. So uh, I just wanted to learn. Mentorship is one of the most important components to any creativity. And um, it might be someone that you know. I feel like I have mentors that I've never met that I listen to. I consume their content or their right. podcasts. But how did you get involved with these guys? And then the other question that goes with that is, what was it like studying under them? The biggest uh, influence in my life, and honestly, is doing the TV show. Um, um, John Taffer is a mentor a lot in, in how to uh, execute, uh, how to make something super successful and preparation, because he's a huge believer in it. But probably my biggest mentor in culinary space was Jose Andres. Uh, Jose Andres is now, um, well, he's he won James Beard Awards. He's been in uh, Time Magazine um, Person of the Year for all the outreach he does around the world. But he would sit there and teach. He's a very tough Spanish chef. But I remember the first time he tasted one of my cocktails, he spit it out on the floor. <laughs> and uh, he was very hard-ass. But for me, you know, I'm one of nine kids. You're not going to phase me with any of that theatrics. I'm there to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so 
I didn't take any of it personal and any of the the tough, tough, tough love that that a lot of these chefs demand and it's yeah, chef, no chef. But the amount that you could learn, the amount that they were willing to give once you saw that uh, you were willing to go the distance, it was then you became a team. Mm-hmm. And on any team like that, you learn so much and become a winning team. And uh, it, so he was my uh, first culinary mentor that just changed my life. How many years was that? I was with him for seven years. And there I uh, really developed and learned molecular gastronomy and avant-garde techniques from French and Spanish okay. words. So for those of us that don't understand what so, that is... It's, in layman's terms. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. It's um, changing the way. So if from my thing, everything is based on an experience. But in molecular work, you can actually change the alcohol from a liquid to a solid. So I can take, um, I can take a cocktail and make it at 300 and 329 degrees below zero or 196 Celsius below zero. So it's actually now a solid and you eat the cocktail with a spoon. Or I can take it and I can use an obelot technique and I can spin it so it becomes almost a cotton candy that you walk around and you pick apart your mojito and you eat it. Mm. So it completely changes the structure of it. Not that it doesn't go back to a liquid, it eventually will, but it's, it's just a really fun way of delivering an experience. So it's really this uh, almost where like science, creativity meet. Absolutely. And you have a lab, right? Yeah. So I have a lab in Franklin, Tennessee, where I have about 4,000 square feet. And we do preparation. I have teams fly in from all over the world. And we work on cocktails. We work on cocktail menus, whether it's for the amazing Princess Cruise line, where we just got named number one in the world for uh, uh, cocktail experiences, Um, uh, whether it's that or Vi Resorts, which we're working with right now. I'm really uh, having having their idea of what they want to have and having the execution from beverage and bar all the way down to what everybody's sipping is really paramount to success. So will someone come to you and say like, hey, we want to design something that represents us. That's one of the best ways. So that way I can get in there and I can understand exactly what they're looking for. I have a fantastic team that I've built around myself. So then we work on it, but also working on the creativity, the experience, and what's often forgotten is the money. Mm -hmm. How are we making money? How are we monetizing? That's something I learned from um, John Taffer with Rescue is like, how, how are we making that dollar count every moment? And how are we being accountable to our guests and ourselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of creatives, well, I feel like in a lot of different creative areas, uh, the monetization aspect is very difficult. Like yes. In, in music and some of the fine arts, painting, unless you, you know, hit it big. But uh, things have become devalued in mm-hmm. art quite substantially. But I feel like as I'm thinking about it, talking with you, uh, one of the cool things is that you can monetize, especially very cool cocktails. And it's one of the arts that I would consider is still doing really well. Right. It can. So. Uh, I was lucky to start my career in um, food and beverage in Manhattan. And so you still have about 70%, 75% of all bars that open close within the first year. So they don't pay attention to the numbers. They may get creative. And I have a lot of friends that are like, oh, I'm never going to serve a vodka cocktail. I'm never going to serve this or that. I'm never going to serve a flavored spirit. When flavored spirits compounded annual growth rates, almost 47%. So you still have to make people happy. You can still be artistic, but you have to monetize that. And for me, I also teach my staffs. It's not about the beverage. It's about the experience. The beverage can be like, wow, it can blow people away. But if they don't react to it, if they don't take a picture, if they don't make a moment out of it, then they can get that drink anywhere. Mm -hmm. So getting to the experience, I often teach of a Yale study that says the rule of 17. Rule of 17 states, people laugh and smile about 17 times a day, but in a great bar, they do it 17 times an hour. If we aren't hitting 17 times an hour, we will be out of business. Wow. That's amazing. You know, so... And that's something for any entertainer to think about. Absolutely. You know, 
I'm always amazed watching the musicians that come in here. And, and really, it's something that you do so well with the podcast here is you talk about that connection with your audience. And you have to be there. You have to be there with them. You have to share those moments with them. And uh, if you're not, you're just losing all the time. And your music can be great, but if they don't connect with you, it's, it's a miss. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that first night, you got behind the bar and you loved it. And it wasn't because necessarily you were serving alcohol, but you were being creative, but you were making connection with people. Right. And that's the, the beauty of being behind the bar and being able to talk to the person and form the relationship. Right. And I bet you formed so many relationships. Mm -hmm. Would that be the part of your career where you feel like it's one of the proudest parts of what you do? I do. I really, the relationships, whether it's with my bar teams, I train thousands of bartenders right now. And um, I, I really want them to be where, wherever they are in the world. I want them to be phenomenal. I want them to be super successful. I teach also because, you know, uh, I'm a dad and all that. I teach um, to have tea at the end of your shift, hot tea. Uh, so you're not reaching for alcohol because it's, uh, it's a slippery slope if every night you're finishing up and you're having drinks. Not that you can occasionally, but you can't every night. Yeah. So it's, uh, I love my staff. I love my teams. I love teaching them. I love teaching them different structures and systems on how to be super successful and then trying to give them hacks on, on how not to make this also your life, that you can be really have a fulfilling life in whatever you're doing, whether it's the bar and music, the bar and acting, the bar and school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's awesome. So how many bartenders worldwide do you think? Right you now have? I have about 1,200 mixologists. I wow. have 7,000 bar professionals. So with um, mainly with like Princess Cruises and all that, I'm helping work and train their teams all over. Uh, so there it's uh, putting together cocktail menus, putting together um, uh, basically steps of service, structure, best ways behind the bar, not only create the experience, but also to sell more. Mm -hmm. uh, the more we sell, the more that uh, <laughs> we're going to do well and be in business. Yeah. So when you approach creating something new, are you thinking – from the perspective of, I want this to sell good, like, you know, make money? Or are you thinking, I want to create something that is utterly unique and different from everything else? And I know that if I focus on the art, then the money's going to come. Um, I think that you, all, you have to have the systems and structures in place. Otherwise, it doesn't matter about the art. We've all been in a bar where you wait, and this, I started employees only in the 90s, and um, we used to make people wait for drinks because that was showing that it took a long time to make a drink. It's a different world now. It is all social media. It is all fast, and yet drink better be coming out quickly. So you have to respect the science of it. You have to respect how long people are willing to wait for something. So uh, you can't make them wait for a long time. It's different time that way. So the art is important and that creativity and that excitement behind it, but you also need to get it out quickly. Uh, for, a, um, for a ship, when we are sailing out of port and it's the, uh, the first day of the inaugural voyage, we have to get out 4,500 drinks in 45 minutes. So it, it, art is there, believe it or not. We will use one or two really cool moments to it but at the same time as we got to fly, we've got yeah, a peg, yeah. we've got a batch, we've got to do everything to make sure that everyone has something to toast with, whether it's an alcoholic drink or a non-alcoholic drink, but everyone has something to celebrate with. Yeah. So when I was first here, you made me a mocktail mm -hmm. and I've only had a couple before that and they were incredibly sweet. And what you made was incredibly dynamic. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what all was in it because it's been a while, but I believe maybe grapefruit was one of the ingredients mm -hmm. but it was delicious and like i'm from california i i stopped drinking uh a couple years ago um and so now i'm in love with coffee but i'll i'll have mocktails yeah but when we did wine like we drink wine and go to napa or whatever and it would be fun to be like oh i taste you know cherry mm -hmm. and this and that and um 
I feel like what you created was like that. It was, uh, you know, you could taste every ingredient. It's almost like you could pick it apart. Right. Like if you were listening to a song and you were like, oh, I hear the guitar over there and the drums over here and the bass over there. Everything was so well balanced and not overpowered by sweetener. Yeah. But delicious. It was the. It was amazing. Um, where are people at with mocktails now? Because I see a lot on social media people that are like, you know, stop drinking. Alcohol's bad for you. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. So, um, do you see a uh, uptick in people ordering non-alcoholic drinks? So, uh, for me, I, I'm really um, lucky to be able to have a global view on it. So, uh, because with the ships, I've, I've right now it's I think I want to say I've. 54,000 cocktails made a day that I design. So, but I get the data on that. And that macro data, I can break down to a micro. And I see a, from 6% to a 12% increase, which means we've doubled the sale of zero-proof um, cocktail experiences. It's amazing. That and low ABV, because people want to have drinks. They want to have fun, but they don't want a sugar bomb. They want to have great experience. They want to have that Flavor, Like, for instance, as I was uh, working with a team recently, I'm like, if you're working with the pepper family, capsaicin, spice, you very rarely need much alcohol to it because it actually releases dopamine in your body. So, mm -hmm. so in other words, when you have a sip of something and it has that spice to it, it registers on your palate that there's something painful going on. And your body releases dopamine to take away the pain on your palate. That's why we get addicted to spice. It's not necessarily um, a taste. It's more of a sensation. So you can create these incredible sensations without having alcohol to it. And people are just, I like to think of it as they're high. They're high on life. Yeah, they're excited. Yeah. They're smiling. But also they don't have to explain to anybody why they're not drinking because the drink is beautiful. It's yeah. elegant. Everyone goes, oh, what are you having? And you say, oh, it's a spicy cocktail with, you know, grapefruit. And everybody's like, oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Now, when it's done, it can be done with alcohol or without. It just has that great flavor. Another thing, I do the live shows, the cocktail theater live shows that mm -hmm. are like History Channel meets Rocky Horror Picture Show. And there we've noticed a double in zero-proof drinks meaning that uh, we call them designated dri driver drinks. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but again, people get to be part of this fun experience. It just doesn't have the alcohol to it. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's interesting because I always felt the pressure, like if I went out or a bar or something and I wasn't drinking, I always felt a little out of place. Yeah. And I never had a problem with alcohol. I just had to, for some medical reasons, stop. And um, I would order like a you know, tonic and lime or something like that. So I look, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know what the pressure was. I don't know what the psychology of that is, but being in that environment, it's like, I want to have something in my hand, you yeah. know, so I don't look like a weirdo. I don't know what it and is. Everybody's there to share their, yeah. their have. And if you are walking around with a, a cola or something like that, and everyone's like, uh, there's almost like a distrust to it. There's almost yeah. like, oh, why aren't you drinking? Why? Exactly. And then you have to explain. And so many times it's, uh, you know, she's maybe pregnant or maybe he can't drink, right? Or maybe they're not. It, it just, so being able to provide something that's just absolutely beautiful and delicious but doesn't yeah. have alcohol is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I love it, man. And I think that's so cool. And it's amazing the data that you're getting on that. Yeah. And I think there's going to be a rise of that just because of social media and people's uh, desire to be healthy. At least I see a lot of it, you know. Yeah. I hear a lot of it on podcasts and that kind of thing. And there's a guy at Stanford Andrew Huberman that has a lab and they do so much research on like psychology and things like that. And, you know, they kind of discourage it. So I think social media has had an impact on yeah. that significantly. No, you're right. You're right. It's, it's drinking healthy. One thing that I've noticed huge is I own a CBD company. So making CBD cocktails. So mm. you're actually drinking healthy. You feel great feel great the next day, everybody's like, and yet you're still having a great time. It just triggers you in a wonderful way. And yeah, because you still get the dopamine. Yes. I think that's what people are chasing is just like mm -hmm. a dopamine hit, yeah. you know? Right. Um, people look forward to that drink at the end of the day or that going out and doing something that's going to make them feel yeah. good. Yeah. Coffee's the same way for oh, me, you know? So 
in the morning. I'm you're a, such co- a cool you're a coffee guy, guy yeah. too. So when you're on the road, so you're traveling all the time. Mm-hmm. How do you kind of stay healthy? Because I I have traveled a bit, not anywhere near what you no, do. No, no. But um, it can be exhausting mentally, physically, break down the immune system. Yeah. I mean, a, a whole a plethora of things. So what do you do to kind of like keep it all together when you're constantly traveling, going in different time zones, etc.? Yeah. Um, so on my flights, I never watch anything. I only read. I eat vegetarian when I travel because you never know. I mm. mean, you could be somewhere in America or you could be, uh, you know, I think the other uh, last month I was in Rome, and then like three days later, I was in Australia. You know, so you just don't know. And trying to eat as clean as possible, super helpful. Uh, that and reading. And then whenever I land anywhere, I try to exercise and stretch. Because mm-hmm. if you're looking at a 15, 16 hour flight, or even like a two, three hour flight, you're still sitting for long periods of time. So um, those are some of the, the big tips for me as far as, and then drinking as much water, especially once I land. Yeah. I don't want to be on the flight drinking a ton of water where you're oh, getting yeah, yeah, up all course. the time. You yeah, know, yeah, but of course. Uh, that those are some of my keys for travel. Yeah. Shifting gears a little bit, I wanna talk about uh, your work with Cardi B. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I just I just, she's just such a personality. Oh yeah. And just seems so wild and vivacious. Mm-hmm. What was a what's a like so doing that. when um, when I first really uh, learned, and it was Inc., that I was going to be working with Cardi B with Whip Shots, I was super excited. But then it dawned on me, this makes no sense at all, <laughs> none whatsoever. So I went to my wife, who's brilliant, right? And I said, Megan, baby, this is so exciting, but it doesn't make any sense. I'm working with Cardi B. How can I make this work? And she's like, it makes lots of sense. She's like, because... You will always be Martha Stewart, and she will always be Snoop Dogg. And as long as you are Martha Stewart, this will work. Uh. So when she goes outlandish, and she's so brilliant at that, I just channel my inner Martha Stewart, and I go, hmm, yeah, that that's a great, you know. And so she, <laughs> and her outlandish stories and her quips drive. I think our first night we launched had 1.6 billion views uh-huh. or impressions. And, but it's all it's all because she is just that genius, and I just drive through the scene as Martha Stewart would. That's a, that's really cool. <laughs> you have a smart wife. Yeah, I know, I know, because otherwise it'd be, woof. Yeah, um, and that now you have national distribution with that product yes. as well, right? Yeah, so everywhere I think except Utah. So I don't know that we'll ever get in Utah, um, which is fine. But uh, but no, it's it's brilliant, and you know, working with uh, the genius, the the mastermind behind it all, Ross Scalar, uh, just I am you know in the right place, right time, and getting to work with the team he put together is unbelievable. Yeah. And if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's very cool because it's non dairy. Correct, non dairy, organic, shelf stable, and so it's alcohol whipped cream, and there's uh, all these different flavors that. We have um, vanilla, mocha, caramel in the summertime. We'll come up with like a key lime in the winter. We always come up with like a a winter Christmas flavors of peppermint and then uh, pumpkin ones. And then we have a new one coming out um, shortly for uh, springtime. So it's really nice. To go way back, so you got into bartending. But as a kid, did you have a dream of like, when I grow up, I want to be... This. So, yeah, when I, I was a kid, I always loved sports. I loved competition. And then I, um, I, I started to model and, and, and do some acting and all that. And uh, my first job uh, was with a guy uh, doing a Mountain Dew commercial. And we were doing a Mountain Dew commercial together, and we were water skiing behind uh, horses. It was hysterical. And um, it was a while ago, and he's like, hey, come out and visit me in Los Angeles, because that's where he was living. And I was like, okay, sure. And I went out and visited him, and he was working about three or four different jobs, one being a chicken on, um, on uh, Sunset Boulevard. And he was the hardest working guy I've 
ever met, yet the nicest and most humble. And um, I asked him once, I said, why are you work? So why you, it doesn't really matter. You know, nobody's watching. He's like, because I'll know. And if I cheat on this, whether it was driving or or waiting tables or working as a chicken on sunset, you know, old pollo loco, he's like, it'll affect my acting. And I was like, really blown away by that ethic. And that guy's name is Brad Pitt. And um, wow. yeah, so uh, he and I were, in fact, my mom, God rest her soul, she just passed. Um, but uh, he stayed at our house in Florida and we went, we went off and we were doing some stuff, went to church, did all these things and came back and Brad had cleaned the kitchen within an inch of its life and mopped the damn floor. We never lived that down from my mom. And, wow. um, but that's the kind of person he is. And, uh, and um, yeah, so as I work with my bar teams, I work with, and they all have usually different dreams and, and all of these things that are just phenomenal. But I'm like, whatever you do here, does go into everything else. So yeah. if you cheat it here, you are cheating you for your your art artistic expression, whether it is acting, whether it is you know music or or even school. You got into you said you were doing some modeling and some acting. Yeah, and you went out to Los Angeles. Yeah, and where were you before that? I was in a, uh, in New York. I was okay. in New York, and then um, and I had a very successful acting career. I um. I ended up uh, working, I had my own TV show for a while, uh, replaced Jerry O'Connell on a show, I did soap operas and off-Broadway and stuff, but um, I ended up working with James Cameron, the director mm -hmm. from Titanic, and I became a single dad basically at the same time. And uh, mm -hmm. I was working with him and Jessica Alba, and um, I ended up quitting the show uh, because I wasn't being the dad I was supposed to be. So I went back to bartending because I had no idea. I was like, you know what, I'll figure it out. But yeah. in bartending, I realized that there was still this amazing story, this powerful uh, expression, this way to connect with people that was just unbelievable. And the stories that you can tell, This, as, as I tell my teams, is like, you're never telling a story. You're always telling a secret. Mm. People hear stories all the time, but they can't wait to repeat a secret. Mm. So with my bar teams, we always try to tell secrets. That's and cool. so, yeah, so um, I ended up going, and, and I figured, you know what, TV was over. And yet I've done more TV now than I, I turn it down all the time. And, and, you know, so it's interesting. That is interesting. So what you learned in the skill of being able to be on TV and being in front of camera, being comfortable and interacting with people mm -hmm. and, you know, put it on your, you know, TV face when it's time to go. You learn all those skills. You had the bartending and then you were mentored and it all just kind of worked. Yeah. But you never like set out as a kid thinking like, I'm going to be a mixologist that's going to change cocktails for the entire world. No, I, I did not. I didn't. It was... um. It was basically, I think, what you do so well and uh, what so many musicians do is I realized that I was a storyteller and my stories were to make people happy. Mm. And, uh, and once, I, once I understood that, it, it really changed the way that I taught and I worked. I no longer cared about being the best or any accolades or any of that. What I wanted was my teams to be the best. What I wanted with people in there to have the best time. When And when we do these cocktail theater, these live shows, they're scripted, they're fun, they're History Channel meets Rocky Horror Picture Show and you drink your way through it. So they're this fun, amazing experience, but that's what it is. It's that storytelling, it's that experience and that's the reaction off of it. I love the storytelling part as a you know songwriter myself yeah because i feel like people connect with stories mm -hmm. but you also said and i've never heard this people know stories but the secret yeah. aspect so for other artists it makes me think how could that be applied you know in music or in you know film uh or you know the fine arts or photography, whatever it is, is a secret thing. Yeah. I think that's really cool. And it kind of makes me think, like, what could I do? Or what could you do in a live show where you feel like the audience knows a secret? 
yeah. because that's that connectivity piece that you were talking about earlier. When I was listening to your stuff, which I thought was phenomenal, I loved and what I, uh, I really appreciated was the part where you were like talking about if somebody's doing a show, but then they also talked about what they did that day. And, and the audience are just something that's really personal and you put yourself out there. No one else would have ever known that. Mm -hmm. And it could be something super simple, something funny that happened or just, you know, at the store, whatever it may be, but people connect off of that and it gets to see a little bit into your world. And I think that's invaluable. Yeah. I'm a big John Mayer fan. Yeah. Um, and he, he played uh, here acoustic and we, me and my wife saw him here at Bridgestone mm -hmm. right across the street and uh, I remember hearing an interview with him where he said he was talking about that and 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 he's on this acoustic tour and it gives him the ability to interact with an audience but he said he got a text message right before he was about to go on stage that his dad was in the hospital they had some health concerns and he was about to go do this show and he was like, I'm going to do a completely different show. And then he was like candid with his audience. But when you open up like that, it invites people in. Right. And I love that. And I think we're scared sometimes as artists or creators to do that, mm -hmm. you know, to open up and invite people in to the yeah. story, to the secret. Yeah. So that's really cool that you mentor because you've been mentored and now you have the ability to do it. Do you see it's more in younger people that are attracted to uh, mixology? Yeah, so I definitely think it's the younger uh, people that are attracted, that are drawn to mixology, that... That, you know, you have all these different TV shows that weren't around when I was, uh, you know, coming up in the scene. Uh, so I see that quite a bit. Um, the challenge at times is everybody, and you see this in culinary as well, is everybody immediately wants to be on Top Chef or just run, mm -hmm. the, run the thing. And the, yeah. right? So there's also the science behind it. There's the numbers, there's the finance and all. Um, but the fact that there's this, this uh, passion behind it. And passion, it so the mixology world has grown so much that it's unbelievable unbelievable so and i think it is a more of a youth driven um brigade if you will so i want to go back for a sec you said you were acting you were a single dad um or, i was actually or, i had two boys at oh, the time you had i have kids. five kids now I mean, it's just you know life happens yeah yeah and as life happens you you and this happens to all of us. We all hit these awful times in life, um, whether it's you know losing a parent, whether it's um, you know, a loved one, uh, anything like that, or even just uh, any challenges that come across. Yeah. And you know, it reminds me of the Wall Street quote where it says, um, "Man looks into the mirror. When man looks into the abyss and sees nothing staring back at him." It's at that moment he knows his character. Mm. And we all face those dark moments. And it's yeah. that belief, that love, that prayer, that trust in the universe that you are, the daybreak will come. I want to dig into that because that's such a crucial piece because how many creatives or how many people are at that point where they're like potentially right on the brink of having the success or that breakthrough. Yeah. But they're also at the point where they're like, I'm miserable, I'm unhappy, I'm getting my butt kicked, I'm broke, you know, all of that stuff, which is real. They see the success, but they don't see everything that went before it. So true. It's so true. You see that all the time um, where people, uh, you know, kind of give up and quit. And our artistic and creatives are the, the worst people in the world because they're the worst people to themselves. Mm. They're so critical. They're so hard on themselves. I remember one actor uh, talking, very successful actor said, only the mediocre ever make it because the truly brilliant give up mm. and they're too tough. They're too mean to themselves. Um, so with, with whether I'm coaching, working with somebody is I always tell them that you need to journal. You need to journal and you need to be positive. You need to expose that negative every single day for 10 minutes. Then you also have to have goals 
and you have to have those goals with dates on them. If you don't have the goals and the dates, you will fail. Yeah. You have to budget. So that's that kind of thing of yeah. just the finest understanding of it because it, uh, those sort of things help so much and then you have to be good to yourself. Yeah. You have to take yourself on a date. You have to go, you know what? I'm going to go see John Mayer. I'm going to go out and I'm going to have an amazing dinner by myself. You have to be good to yourself. It's from the book, The Artist's Way. And I loved that book. But we all think that the harder we are on ourselves, the better the outcome will be. And that's just not the way the universe works. Yeah. You know, it's the more, the kinder. We work hard, but we're really good to each other. It brings out this energy that's just beautiful that people want to be around. And again, talking about Brad Pitt, that's what he had constantly. And it just draw, drew people to him. I find for myself... And that there's like the voice in your head that's constantly being critical. Oh, you yeah. You know, like you're not good enough. Or if I was doing anything creative, it's like, oh, you could have done that better. Mm -hmm. Or you could have played that better or sang that better or whatever it is. And it's constantly being critical. And uh, I had this. I heard this thing about the um, compassionate best friend, and it was basically, if you had a best friend, what would you tell that person that's going through the same thing yeah, that you're going through? Yeah, I love through? that. I love that. And it was interesting because you bring up journaling, and I almost feel like that can be where you have the compassionate best friend, yeah. where it's like, yeah, you messed up on that thing. That's okay, man. It's like not going to change the world. Your yeah. career's not over. Um, and I myself have gotten super into journaling. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think it's cool that you encourage as you mentor people to do that because it's changed my life. Yeah. And it's helped me kind of rewire how I think, mm -hmm. but it's taken a long time. Yeah. How did you learn about journaling? I learned about journaling is uh, I started, I, I read a lot. I tr try to read a book a week. I try to read as much as I can. Um, and from there, I, I read um, some Anthony Robbins stuff, and I loved the way that he worked on goal setting and he worked on journaling and trying to be good to yourself. So then I just started reading everything I could, and then the book The Artist's Way was the same way. as like, so the more that we write it, the more it kind of becomes true. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of makes a declaration to the world, to the universe, to God, that this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is what I'm accomplishing. And it also quiets that voice in your head. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, um, my wife uh, it was a runner in, in high school, and she said she had the greatest, greatest uh, cross-country uh, coach. And she said they used to run hills. And when they'd get to the top of the hill, she said, the coach used to make you smack the hill and thank the hill, even though it almost killed you, because you wanted to thank the hill for making you stronger. Mm. And I often think of that. So many get up there and they forget to thank themselves. You just got through something brutal that most people would have wilted by. They would have crumbled. They would have quit. But if you're the artist, you got to be good to yourself and you've got to thank the hill. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I think it's really important as well because so many artists don't have the, let's say, entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. Or it's you're very creative, but you're unorganized and all over the place. You right. know, you know, those kinds. Yeah. So the fact that you're like mentoring, like, let's talk about that a little more because I think that's really important for artists to understand if they want to have a career in any field, cr you know, creative wise from mixology to you name it to acting you know to being in hollywood uh understanding the principles of being disciplined doing things you don't want to do talk to me about that because i think that's really something important two people that um exemplify that the best way the first one would be a bartender of mine in um la um tall great looking guy said he could sing i had no idea so i'm running this place or, or i'm part running a sonoma wine garden which is a wine garden he's bartending at he's like listen <laughs> little we're, snow we're in a bar by we're the in way. a bar by the way <laughs> so he's like listen uh i'd love to be singing on sunday nights there's nobody here anyway and it, uh, i'm working it and yeah. I'm, like, I'm like all right yeah sure so he started singing to three people then 10 people and then started to fill it up and um his name was Brett Young. 
And so he did wow. pretty well by himself. Yeah. The other person that the discipline comes to is uh, I worked with uh, Matthew McConaughey for almost two decades now. And we do a charity together called Just Keep Living, where we go into schools, uh, underprivileged schools, challenge schools and all that. And we give talks, talks to kids and all that, which uh, change the way they're thinking. Um, he's, he literally gives back so much, but he starts every day. He goes, I hate it. I hate it. But he starts every day with a workout, with an exercise of something. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a full workout, but just something to get the blood flowing and mm -hmm. stuff. And he and his wife are just awesome people, but they give back so much. It's unbelievable. They're, they're brilliant, great artists, they, but they're good to themselves. And, um, you know, they they just really uh, give back. In that the book he put out, Green Lights. Yeah. Uh, he he talked about when he first went to L.A. and basically he was with this guy, and the guy was like, "You want it too much," and he said, "You know, you need to leave until you forget about like basically wanting." to be an uh, actor too much or whatever. So he goes off and rides motorcycles in Europe with his friends. He comes back, forgets about everything. And then uh, the guy he's with, this agent dude, he's like, tomorrow morning we have a meeting with William Morris. And it was because he had forgotten all about the fact that he was holding on to trying to make something happen and, and desperate, not in a place where you're trying to make it happen right more right. like open-handed yeah. i guess you could say mm -hmm. um because he had that goal and when it comes to writing goals what do you think about when you don't reach your goal that you had written down and put a date on mm -hmm. like uh i've done it and i've realized like it's great because it gets you way further than you would have been in some areas but sometimes you have to pivot too yeah how do you address goal writing when you don't hit the goal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's times you certainly don't, but you grow so much from it. And I think that if you just do it for a month or two, you may go, oh, well, I didn't get a best-selling record. I didn't have this. I didn't. Have... But if you really do it for the year, if you do it, that you're going to be amazed what you accomplish. And sometimes it's not, um, I'm going to get this but it's what you become along the journey. And it's recognizing that. And that goal drove you and it made you overcome so many different things and you're such a better person for it. So you have to be able to recognize that. I know that when I was acting, it was like, oh, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, we, when I was on All My Children, we won the Emmy and that was really fun. And then I was like, oh, I'm gonna win this and I'm gonna win that and I'm gonna do all of this. And when I stopped acting, um, I, I, I still realized that it was about becoming a better person. Mm -hmm. And although those goals were now different, um, I was going to be a better dad. And I, I was. I was there coaching everything and then uh, working at night, not sure what was going to be next and all of that. But I was like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing now and trusting in that. Uh, it's not what I had pictured, and there were people that would come up to the bar going, oh, guess your career didn't work out, and yeah, you'd laugh yeah. about it. Yeah. But at the inside, you die a little bit. But then I realized that, no, I'm still doing something. Uh, and as the cocktail theater started to come out, all these different ways started to come out to entertain, is it just became bigger, but it only became bigger because I drove myself you know, in acting so much and now i use that constantly whether it's yeah. directing producing you know all of these different tv shows i do or the tv show i produce and do and it's like all of that comes from that core that i work my ass off on and i almost would have beaten myself up and thought well i failed at it but it i use it all the time now in different ways so yeah. it's really interesting and fun so you develop the mental muscle almost yeah absolutely i thank the hill yeah. I heard this quote, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. That's a great one. I hadn't heard that. That's awesome. Yeah. I think the importance of reading is very, you know, significant in the role of someone that is being educated because you learn so much.
Yeah. Um, like we were talking about earlier, the mentors that I haven't met are almost like people I've read in a book. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like I can hear someone's life story and it impacts me as if I sat down and talked to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And the sad part is it's almost 70% of the people that graduate high school will never read another book. Yeah. So it's, they just miss out. And I, I'm guilty too, is like whether it's social media or other things, you get distracted. And so I try to budget an absolute hour a day that I just read. So if I'm on a flight, I've got like four or five hours, but I try to say, okay, from 10.30 to 11.30 or from, I try to get up early at five or so, but sometimes I don't, I still try to make sure I'm reading it. And sometimes it's just 20 minutes, but if you get in that habit, you'll be blown away and read some fun stuff. Oh, don't always worry about trying to read the smartest stuff, Marcus Aurelius and stuff in the room, mm, yeah. but read some fun stuff that you enjoy and then, you know, mix it in with some, some higher learning things. Yeah. I think I can speak for a lot of people. We grow up in a small town, maybe, mm -hmm. and we kind of grow, uh, grow up or develop our formative years in a bubble. Yeah. I think it's uh, I, not everybody, but I think that we all kind of have our own bubble. You've been fortunate to be able to travel, mm -hmm. travel the globe. What has that done in your view of how you see things and how you see the world, how you see people. Well, I think uh, on a global scale, for me, each sip brings us closer together. Uh, one of my favorite places to travel was St. Petersburg, Russia. Mm. And everybody at first, no matter where you are, they want to try to talk politics. And when they realize you just aren't interested in that, but you're really kind of teaching or making great drinks, then after a while, everybody's having fun. Everybody's celebrating. And then they start to share. And it's unbelievable. And so whether it's, you know, uh, Japan, China, Germany, yeah, Spain, Russia, it's it's been incredible to be to these different places and share these moments and these experiences with people from completely different cultures. Do you find that when you go to those cultures and you have that sip that it's like they're not that different than I am at all? It's so true. They really want to, again, that rule of 17. They want to have fun. They want to laugh. They want to be storytellers, and they can't wait to hear and share a secret. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of division. Mm -hmm. And I kind of have this philosophy that People kind of all want the same thing, yeah. which is, like you said, they want to laugh. They want the stories. They want to feel loved yeah. and have love and give love, you know? Yeah. And so it's interesting that you say that because I think it's true amongst all people pretty much that we're not that different. Right, right. I completely agree. All right, so... Uh, I'm going to ask you some fun questions. I love it. I love it. So, craziest experience on television? Craziest experience on television was the first time I did Bar Rescue. I thought the show was going to be kind of a joke. And, all right, I've done TV. I've done, you know, tons of, you know, years of shows and stuff. Uh, it's going to be a riot. I get there. Taffer comes out and he is screaming at everybody because everybody deserves it flat out. I think two of the people are high. One's probably high end drunk. And, and the next thing you know, you hear this person screaming from the kitchen and they've got a knife and they're going to run out and they're going to come at it us. And I hightailed it out of there so fast and didn't come back to the next day. <laughs> and that's when I knew that... Um, Rescue was going to be a different show. It's been eight years on it, and um, John Taffer runs that thing like a, a, a genius. We're about to do our 250th uh, episode for reality TV shows. He, just unbelievable. But that that was a chill because it was a little scary, and it was on camera. I don't think they could show that part of it, but uh, there's some moments in that show they just can't even show on camera because they're too crazy wow that's awesome that, that was, was nuts funny. so you just left i left yeah done 
I'm at least, you know, uh, normally they were pretty close, but I didn't go back to the hotel and stuff like that, but I was far from set. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's the craziest uh, place you put an event on, like, or the, you know, craziest slash most, like, surprising to maybe the, the viewer and listener? Um, the craziest was probably when I launched the SLS Hotel at the Brickle, um, we did a cocktail theater there on the rooftop for 3,000 people. And what I did was you can't serve 3,000 people. You can batch it and you have all those cocktails yeah. flying out. So what I did was I took drones and I flew in drones that had cocktails on them. And I would land them in amongst the people. And I'd had these searchlights find the drones in the air as they were coming down. Because for me, it's all about the experience. You yeah. want people taking a picture and wow and all of it. And so um, that was, uh, and I was really uh, excited and proud of my team to be able to carry that and yeah. to do something that was so unexpected. Yeah, yeah. Did you, uh, did you have to go to school to learn this? Like, did you go to college to learn how to do what you do? Or was it just getting out there and doing it? I, um, for me, I... Uh, for the acting part, I was I went to the Royal Academy in London for a bit, got kicked out, another story. <laughs> um, but um, then I got to study at Carnegie Hall and perform there for years. So I learned uh, uh -huh. how to um, smash your concept of what's expected. And I mm -hmm. think that's really important after many nights that didn't work. So the, yeah, there were yeah. successes, but there were sometimes few and far between. But an amazing teacher called Wynne Hanman. That was just a, a genius. And then for culinary, it was really just honestly working with so many amazing chefs. My God, with uh, uh, Fran Andrea, with Jose Andres, uh, learning from Gordon, um, uh, just all of these people that would just, once they realize that you're in it to win it, they, they just give you the keys to the kingdom. They say, this is how it works. This is how to create an ionic bath. This is how to, you know, stabilize this. This is how to create a, an espuma or work with nitrogens or inert gases. And so they, they really just give it all because they can't take it with them and they're just super successful. So, yeah. you know. It's interesting because the people that I meet that want to give back the most are the people that have had success. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience at least. Yeah. It's almost like passing the baton in, yeah. a, in a sense, you know? Um, and I think the philosophy of helping people, which is almost what I feel like from this conversation I'm getting, is that you didn't focus on like, oh, I'm just going to get rich and make cool cocktails. It was, I'm going to bring a smile to people's faces. I'm going to... I'm going to help people. I'm going to bring joy to people. I'm going to bring that, that 17, you know, laugh experience in a bar and you got educated and learned. But at the end of the day, you said, I want to help. Absolutely. So this is an accidental profession. Yeah. And I think most of us in our life are in an accidental profession. But the core was always being a storyteller to make yeah. people happy. Yeah. And so once I embraced that, I could make goals. And then whether I exceed, made those goals happen or not, it drove me to a place that where I could examine and not listen to that negative part, examine where I've grown and how that has changed and made me better, but helped me reform my goals as I kept going. So. Yeah. Have you been able to silence that negative voice more? No, it's always there. That's why you have to always recognize it. Yeah. You can recognize it, and you can journal, and you can write things. You'll be amazed. And then also in your journaling, always take time. And it's so hard, but to write how great you are. Mm. Just like I am. And I heard I this that. great thing in the Bible that says the two most important words in the Bible, the two most powerful, are they called I am. Mm. So you declare who you are. I am loved. I am loving. I am creative. I am heard. I am a storyteller. Write it. Take 10 minutes to write it. Don't stop, but only write good things about yourself. Because I think it's like almost 80 to 85% of the time we are critical to ourselves, yeah. our subconscious is. So yeah. be good to yourself. Our yeah, subconscious just runs this negative, you mm -hmm. suck all yeah, day long, yeah, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. What I find amongst creatives, and you can speak to this, are, they're some of the most insecure people yeah. 
Would you agree? They look for the critic because they want to hear the critic try to convince that. It doesn't matter if there's 10,000 said how you great you are. They look for that one critic, which they'll find, and then they kind of ballast themselves off of that. So how do you deal with the critic? Eleanor Dews, who was uh, this famous uh, actress in the early 1900s, right? And they, she had, there's a book about her called The Mystic in the Theater. And she said, um, ballast yourself with reality and throw yourself into a sea, a sea of inspiration. Mm-hmm. Meaning just look for the beauty. And this is when no women were supposed to be acting, let alone leading Broadway plays. And she was. And everybody just abused her and talked about how awful she was and all that. But people couldn't wait to see her perform. She was that powerful. Wow. And, um, and so really it's just embrace your power own it and, and live it every day yeah it i started doing the i am statements recently it's kind oh, of serendi- yeah it's serendipitous that you mentioned that because um i would say i'm thankful for in my journaling time mm-hmm. and like start with gratitude uh but i never really said i am it's kind of like positive affirmations in a sense mm-hmm. But I, that negative voice for me is so strong all the time. Like, yeah. you're a failure mm-hmm. or you're not good enough or whatever it may be that we all feel as human beings. And so when I started doing the I am, it's like uh, this weight is lifted off your shoulders yeah. almost. Yeah. Like, there's a visceral reaction to just those words. Yeah. It's weird. The first, like, paragraph of I am is hard. It's really hard because like, you're like, wait, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And then you kind of get into flow. And that's where I feel that exact thing, that that lightness come off. And then by the end, I'm like, all right, all right, all right, let's, yeah. let's make this happen. Yeah, we can do this. Yeah, we can do this, yeah, you know, and, and the voice is quiet at the end. Yeah. So last question, what is your biggest piece of advice for creatives? My biggest piece of advice for creatives is to be good to yourself. Uh, you were given this gift, this, this divine energy has come in you, and you have a story to tell. Make sure you tell it. Make sure you tell your secrets. Make sure you're good to yourself. Make sure you're kind and loving to yourself first, because if you aren't, you can't be loving to others. You have to be nice to yourself. And if 85% of the time we're negative to ourselves, then you know there's that other 15 that's positive. Well, you wouldn't treat an enemy that way or a best friend or anybody. Mm -hmm. So really be good to yourself. Find different ways. Find different ways of journaling, of of different goal setting. And if it's not just goal setting, I like for, for, for me, for physical, I like the habits of just the habit of, of getting to the gym. If I can get there, I'm going to attend a class. I'm going to get there, I'm going to do four or five ni- weeks, uh, four or five days a week. So really just forming those really wonderful habits and being good to yourself and rewarding yourself. Most importantly, your I am's and love yourself. I love that. Being good to yourself. It's hard. It's hard. It's super hard. Yeah, But I think we all need to hear that. We mm-hmm. all need to do that. So you've been very good to me. To oh, us for, thank you. For being here. Thank you for being on the podcast and sharing your story and your insight. Uh, I think that it's going to impact a lot of people. I am stoked for you and what's to come and what you're doing. Well, thank you very much. It's been it's so nice. I've loved your stuff. So I've been peeking and taking a look at yourself on Instagram too. So um, no, I'm just, I'm thrilled. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know what platform you're listening on. If you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, but if you didn't know, you can watch the whole thing on YouTube and uh, please just subscribe where you like to listen so you can be up to date with the latest episodes. Hope you have a great week and we will see you back next Monday.